And thanks for joining us. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so just kind of saying that out loud. Um, my name is Suchi Deshpande. I um, am going, I'm hosting the webinar on how, how to improve test taking skills for neurodiverse learners. And as we step through this, we'll uh, talk to you about why is it different? Why is it important? and um, why specific strategies are going to help your learner uh, go a long way. So today we have uh, Dr. Sheila Murphy, who has been, uh, you know, who's been, who's been with Learnfully a very long time, who's an EF uh, executive functioning expert and a very valuable team member. Uh, and of course, we also have with us uh, Kevin, who is a test prep expert and is going to be helping answer some of our questions uh, some of our burning questions that we've had as parents and uh, executive functioning uh, coaches and education experts as well. So um, just to kind of start things off, uh, first of all, <laughs> I'm fighting a little bit of a cough. So if you hear me pause and cough, you know, sincere apologies in advance, uh, but getting that out of the way right now. But what you can expect is uh, we're going to do a quick introduction on, on what this means uh, you know, why is this even important? Like, what is neurodiversity? How How is it even going to impact test taking? And so there's just a quick intro on that. And then we're going to meet our experts in terms of what they're seeing these days. Why is it different from before? And um, the audience Q&A, this is the burning, this is the most important section. This is why you're here. And this is where we're going to step through the questions that you've essentially rank ordered and said, hey, these are the questions I really want answered. Now, are these the only questions we're gonna answer? Not necessarily. We do have a Q&A um, section in the Zoom box. Uh, please put your questions in there. Now, the only thing we can do is if there's time, we're obviously going to try and answer as many live questions as we can. Um, excuse me. <laughs> if there's something specific, like, hey, you know, my kid's doing this, uh, you know, can you help us, you know, in this particular instance, that's probably something we can't answer uh, immediately. But what we typically tend to do is we publish a blog right after we're done with the webinar. And there's a very good chance that a lot of the questions that don't get addressed will be addressed in that format. And we will send out uh, an email uh, yeah, an email with, you know, the blog, a link to the blog, so you can essentially have uh, access to that and more. And uh, I already mentioned the live questions part. So with that, uh, just kind of want to, again, go over, uh, you know, our guests. So uh, Dr. Sheila Murphy, she's been with us uh, for a while. She is an executive functioning uh, expert, and that's been a hot topic recently which is a shame because this is something, executive functioning is not a new thing. It's just something that we've learned about recently that we'll touch upon in this, um, uh, you know, in, in this webinar as well. Uh, Kevin Organziak, who is a test prep expert. Uh, thank you for joining us. Love having you here. Uh, this is a great intersection of why test prep and, and how neurodivergent neurodiver students learn and how we can get some uh, tricks and tips in here. And uh, of course you have me uh, where, and I'll be hosting the webinar. Uh, before we get into it, just wanted to do a little bit of research. I mean, or rather show you a little bit of what we've essentially learned. Uh, so it's basically, you know, you have kids that go through elementary school. When they, some of you like, you know, when they start reaching middle school, that's when you start seeing that, okay, you know, now they're no longer in one classroom. They're starting to split up, going into different classrooms. So that's when you start seeing that, okay, you know, this is where they're starting to learn that independence. And by the time they get to high school, they're expected to have that system for independence. Now, does it happen? Not necessarily. And so this is essentially where neurodivergent learners, you know, maybe struggle a little bit. And one of the rites of passages, if you will, is testing skills. And whether we want to roll with it or not, I mean, I will be the first one to say that testing skills is not necessarily a measure of how smart a student is, 
but it is a measure that society uses for traditional careers. And so if you want to take a traditional career, you want to go for you know traditional college, that is a way of how people measure communication of ideas, academic performance, and future career success. And now what's needed as part of this, um, obviously, is skills such as time, stress management, planning organization, critical thinking, problem solving. You need all these skills, essentially, to take a test, believe it or not. And these are not necessarily, these are not skills that everyone innately possesses. So a lot of times in middle school, these are probably skills that, you know, some of them possess innately, but some of them don't. So they're probably, you know, learning how to deal with stress, how to manage time. And you're expected to go through certain phases in middle school, and you're expected to have version two in high school of, you know, like having those skills. But for neurodivergent learners, you're probably 10 steps behind in certain things. You might have strengths in other areas, but you might have significant challenges, like say in time management, because we are all out of the box thinkers when it comes to uh, certain things and, and testing is encouraging you to think within a box. So it's just a very, very different skill set. And so, uh, so that's why testing is just not the same as study skills. So test taking is not the same as studying. Like it, it it's like test taking is basically synonymous to performance skills. Like I can definitely remember the number of times when I'm in a meeting and someone's asking me a question and I I know I did that, but I may not be able to answer it in that moment, probably because I was thinking of something else or I just didn't remember it. Or it was like a month old because it's like being put on the spot because they're asking you to perform in that moment. It's like someone having a conversation versus you presenting something in front of a thousand people. Like, you know, you could have a completely different quality of answer depending on what your comfort level is. So there are factors that you can either cope with innately or you would need tools for. So when someone's taking a test, you're racing against time, there's probably the anxiety of, oh crap, you know, what if I do badly? And that's working against you and, and you know, like eating up your space in the brain. And then there's application. You know, maybe you understood it a little differently. And when it looks a little different, you know, you're having a hard time with it. Um, and then, you know, like the most popular one, like I had a brain fart moment. Like you can't recall it. You, you know, you learned it. Like, how do you get it? And then maybe the environment's noisy or maybe it's too quiet. Like for me, it's very unsettling when it's too quiet. And then what do you do? Maybe you need the right amount of noise. So there's a lot of factors depending on what works for you that are beyond your control. So that's why test taking is not, you know, it's not like you can give them a pat on the back and say, do your best, ignore everything else. And, you know, the world is your oyster. So it's definitely a skill uh, because now you have these brilliant kids who do really well everywhere else. And now you're saying, forget all that brilliance. And now I really need you to think within the box. So it's just a very, very different set of skills that we're plan preparing them for. And so the last slide that I kind of want to, you know, just kind of highlight is that, you know, neurodiversity, you know, the if you want to put a label to it, you know, the lowest, the common denominator over here is executive functioning, which we'll get into uh, at a, you know, at a basic level. And so the common denominator over here is executive functioning, which I want to highlight is the frontal lobe of the brain, and it's how you access your cognition. So it's like attention, uh, endurance, regulation. It's how you access your cognition. It's, it's not about how smart you are. It's about how you access your cognition. And so if you kind of look at, you know, where kids with ADHD or even anxiety, like what they struggle with are factors that are maybe needed for test taking. So that's why kids who have, who are neurodiverse 
can struggle with test taking skills because a lot of times executive functioning plays a huge role in the ability to essentially take a test. So what I wanna do at this point is to pass it on to Dr. Sheila Murphy to uh, just give a quick refresher on uh, executive functioning. On to you. Thank you. So um, we love to use this graphic in, in that uh, your executive functioning skills are sort of like the control center at an airport. You're trying to navigate multiple layers, multiple things um, juggling in the air at the same time in order to function as an everyday adult um, or everyday human being. And so where the struggle comes for neurodivergent learners, um, diagnosed or undiagnosed, or um, pretty much anyone, there are strengths that you may have, there are areas of concern or challenge that you may have. So we like to um, give this visual so that you can see clearly what are the executive functioning skills that a, a human has. Um, and I will point out a few of them after we just briefly talk about a couple um, to, that, that specifically stand out for uh, taking tests. So we know that uh, when you navigate everyday conversations, relationships, um, tasks that you need to be doing, work um, and or community building, you need these, these areas, you need impulse control. So you are not um, behaving in a way that is not going to support building relationships. Um, attention so that you can put all of your attention where you need to be uh, at that moment. Uh, working memory is very obvious is in terms of assessment and test taking because it is all about recalling memory, but it also has to do with uh, building building relationships, having conversations with people, um, remembering where you're supposed to be at a different time of the day. So all of these areas to work together in conjunction to support what you're doing from the minute you wake up in the morning to the minute you go to bed at night. Some of the ones that I think are really important for test taking that we will sort of dive into through dialogue in um, some of the replies. Organization is a really important one when you think about organization in terms of organization. Are you organized? Do you have all of the items you need? But um, And that's the obvious one. But organization of thought is another thing. So if you're sitting down to take an assessment and your thoughts are just going every which direction and you can't focus them, um, that also is a disorganization of thought. So helping learners to organize thought so that they can truly provide the, um, you know, their knowledge of what they know about a subject area. Task initiation. Um, goes hand in hand, can go hand in hand with flexible thinking. If you don't think you know how to do something, sometimes just giving up seems like the easiest. So instead of initiating and working and nose to the grindstone of maybe taking care of the, uh, doing a, a paragraph or, or short answer, um, instead of just giving up, I don't know this answer, I can't do it, I'm going to fail this test anyway. Um having the perseverance, having the flexibility of thought, having a growth mindset around, I can do this if I just persevere. Um, and then really time management for a lot of these assessments, even if it's unlimited time, if you're a student that struggles with what does time management look like, you may either rush really fast because you think, oh my goodness, I might run out of time or everybody else seems to be finishing. So it's your perception of time. So you rush, don't do your best job, or you take so long that um, that you aren't able to, you're, you're over exhausting and over um, working, you're over taxing your brain. So just some areas that you may find for an executive functioning challenged student. We also really think it's important for us to debunk some myths because sometimes people think that uh, executive functioning challenges have a lot to do with your IQ or how smart you are, which is absolutely not the truth. 
Um, what executive functioning does is helps you to access what you know and what you're thinking. So if you've ever been around somebody that has impulse control or emotional uh, control outbursts, they're probably not thinking or speaking clearly. And it's because your brain literally shuts down your thought process if you're overreacting, over emotional, have too much impulse control. So if you think about when you're trying to access learning, if you're panicked or stressed, your brain is shut down and it can't access um, your cognition. So supporting learners in their executive functioning is what gives them the access to their knowledge. 65% uh, of all learners are impacted by executive dysfunction. This is actually probably a very low number, especially post, um, post COVID. And it doesn't, even if you don't have a diagnosis of ADHD or ASD or any of those, uh, executive dysfunction doesn't always have a label. So it is absolutely probably higher than 65% because you won't necessarily have a learning disability diagnosis if you have executive dysfunctions. 85% of success is due to the soft skills, such as critical thinking, communication, and executive functioning. Because you could be the smartest person in the room, but if you can't transfer your knowledge in the workplace or support a, a team in the workplace or in school, you aren't going to have success in isolation. And so it's very important that you can access executive functioning skills in order to have success in life. I do want to point out that in a recent study, they said that employers are looking for one skill from the recent generation, and that's adaptability. That's executive functioning. And so, so yeah, it's, it is a huge uh, thing that's lacking. Uh, and yeah, and, and I think, you know, COVID has a lot to do with it. And, and that's basically been, uh, you know, the theme. But yeah, no, I think uh, Sheila, we can absolutely, uh, you know, move on if you want. It's, uh, you know, sure. to like the main part of the presentation. Uh, yeah, but go ahead, please talk about your experience and your impact. Um, yeah, my experience is I actually have three sons who are now uh, in their late 20s and 30s, and they all struggled with ADHD and dyslexia. When I was getting them diagnosed, the third one, I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Where did this come from? And the uh, diagnostician looked at me like, where do you think it came from? Because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So uh, in doing a lot of reflecting and working them through school, which was uh, a huge challenge for all of us, I really early in came to realize that it really was about the executive functioning skills and social emotional learning that I knew was going to get them through in a successful way. So I'm happy to report they are all successful adults. Um, the impact it's had, I, I went back to school and got four degrees in 10 years because I believe so much in that this message and these tools need to be shared with other families because we struggled so much. Um, in all of their schooling. And it didn't matter how much money you had. It didn't matter what resources you were able to get. There just wasn't the information I felt like that was out there that was helpful um, for them in a way that they needed it. And so that is why I do what I do. And uh, in addition to that, you're being very modest. Uh, she's had a very successful career as a principal and as a district personnel. And uh, we're very, very thrilled to have her as part of Team Learnfully. All right. So Kevin, uh, we've been your turn. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Same thing. Uh, you know, we'd love to hear more from you. Well, thank you for having me, Sushi, and thank you, Dr. Murphy. Um, so <clears throat> my experience, it's its not unlike, I think, Dr. Murphy's in that um, I had uh, a son who struggled in school um, and then crushed standardized tests. So I was very confused about that and ultimately got into the, the area that I'm in now, which is college advising and test preparation because of that. Um, I've been in this 
uh, education space for about 20 years. I've been uh, an admissions advisor. I've been a teacher. I have been a tutor and a tutor trainer. And now I mostly work with kids uh, uh, to get into college. Um, my impact, I, I feel like uh, the approach that we take is it's based in growth mindset. It's that, you know, failures represent the best opportunities for learning and they should, uh, it, you shouldn't worry about failing or making mistakes. You should revel in them and grow from them. And I, I think we've had a, a great impact on a number of students and helping them sort of reduce their anxiety by looking at learning in that way. And uh, I do what I do because uh, I think education is, it's the great equalizer. I, I, I want to help people. You know, I've, I've always sort of been a mission-driven person in my life. So I feel like this is a great way to help other people achieve their education and career goals. So that's, that's I'm also a, a spouse, parent, obviously, uh, and uh, a sustainability enthusiast, if anyone cares. So. <laughs> We do. We're from California. So absolutely. Yeah, no. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, no, with that, uh, you know, let's begin the uh, Q&A part of it. And like I said, please feel free to, uh, you know, have your questions uh, and we'll try to answer them live as well. So the first one is um, my kid knows or my kid kids know all the answers to the test, but seems to choke while taking them. What can I do? I do want to emphasize that um, the uh, uh, they didn't really specify if it was the whole test or a specific question. So I think it's okay to assume that uh, choke could mean uh, not incom like not finishing an exam or you know like not completing a question that they would probably know what the answer is to. So I think because this is a two-parter, Kevin, I would love for you to start the question and, and Sheila, if you wouldn't mind taking that on after sure. Kevin, yeah. Sure, so well, most uh, so most of our experience has been um, with kids that they run out of time or uh, they, they, are, they have impulse control issues and they choose you know, what they think is the best answer too quickly without reading full a question, complete reading through a question completely. Um, and ultimately, I think it, it boils down to that performance anxiety that we were talking about earlier. It's being able to organize information in a short period of time and get the question right more often than not. We see a lot of issues in math with being able to translate word problems into math like you're basically decoding uh, a sentence and putting it into math speak and that can be you know very difficult for for a lot of children or a lot of students and um, and then reading comprehension and the ability to read long passages and retain reading those are are things which all we see that are, are pretty common um, and so choke you know it, it can be a, a certain question type. It can be just the fact that there's the pressure of time. It's really hard to to boil it all down, but those are some of the most common things that we see. Got it. Sheila, would you like to take that on? You're on mute. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the most important things when you know that this is a challenge that you have is really figuring out what what is the thing that you're choking on? Is it that the test gets put down in front of you and you panic and you go into the lizard brain and your thought process shuts down? Is it that you actually really do think you're nailing it and the test comes back and you just slaughtered it uh, in not a good way? He <laughs> slaughtered, not slayed. Um, so it's really knowing like, what is the thing that is getting in the way of the success for the test? Because all of those can be broken down into an executive functioning skill. So again, time management and understanding um, how to manage time within an assessment. Does that mean you start with the types of questions you do well on, build your confidence and then move on to the others? Does it mean that you're better with paper than online or, or vice versa? Um, is it that you, um, 
you know, you have like the impulse control of like, you just want to rush through it, but you don't stop and take the time to go back and check your answers. And so what are the skills and strategies that you can build um, specifically within executive functioning? Because again, that's always what's going to be in your way. What is it that you need to practice and hone in on so that you aren't choking, quote unquote, um, and you're entering it prepared and knowing I just rush through tests because I want to get it done because they make me feel yicky. And then and building that stamina uh, to where then you, you know, embrace it, the growth mindset. I get to show what I know and it's a fun thing. Got it. Um, and I think there was a question that came in and it I, it feels like there's a similar thread. There was uh, the question was it it feels like neurodiverse students have different needs, but how do you help those with low working memory? And it feels like the common thread is it's important to first recognize you know, where the issue is. I mean, this is like one of my favorite sayings and I think Sheila's gonna roll her eyes when I say this. It's like a well-defined, you even know where I'm going. A well-defined problem is a problem half solved. So if you know what those choke points are, yeah. then you're gonna understand better where you're going to choke. Therefore, like if you walk into a situation and not know what's going to happen, then you're absolutely going to not know like what the situ what you're walking into. So and working yeah. memory, I think that one is the one that most people are like, well, how do you, what are you going to do about that? If they don't know, they don't know. Or if they forgot, it fell out of their brain, it fell out of their brain. Yeah. But the reality of it is there are strategies and yeah. there are things that um, accommodations are huge in, in terms of if working memory is a problem yeah. because it, if you are having an assessment or a test read to you, it's very different than if you're trying to read it, figure yeah. out what each word means or how to decipher yeah. it. And then you're trying to yeah. uh, remember the question. For as sure, you're for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Those kinds of things can support. Yeah. Yeah. Each. Yeah, you're right. Each EF thing can have its own strategy, but but understanding what that is. And then coming up with a strategy is is step two, basically. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes and, sense. And if I could, if I could just chime in in terms of like, uh, like just practical ways in in the yeah. world of test prep and tutoring, um, we work on reducing longer problems into manageable tasks. Mm -hmm. So, shortening the the tab, creating you know small tasks and completing those tasks towards a larger, longer problem. Um, writing all over the test booklets, when you can write on the test booklets, making symbols, you know, using visual organizers uh, so that you don't have to tax your working memory quite so much because you have information right in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's, that's me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh... Moving on to the next question. Great discussions, by the way. Um, given we are working with neurodiverse learners, how early should we start practicing test-taking skills? Uh, uh, Sheila, let's start with you over here. And then Kevin, I'd love to, for you to take it on as well. Yeah, I, I love this because I think we're going to have two totally different perspectives on this. Um, as as a, uh, an ex-educator, in elementary school, middle school, and um, and a, a principal that oversaw like state testing, that kind of thing. Honestly, I believe with my whole heart, as soon as you see a student struggling and having any angst, any angst, that's when you start getting them support. Because honestly, it's again, I go back to it's all about the executive dysfunction is why they're challenged. So absolutely high school, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely let Kevin take over the whole high school, middle school, because you're thinking now about college and, and future, but I'm thinking, you know, you have these little guys in, in even younger elementary school having test anxiety. You don't want that test anxiety to interrupt their test taking skills in high school because you didn't address it early in. So I firmly believe it's not about where 
putting extra pressure on these kids. It's about where we're beefing up their executive functioning skills that are going to transfer to every part of their learning as they continue the building blocks towards, um, you know, their college and career readiness. I, I agree a hundred percent, you know, the, the earlier that students can work on the skills related to test taking, and there are different types of tests and, and assessments, but, Generally speaking, the earlier uh, and the more familiar students become with test taking, the better. You know, the longer, the longer they have to evolve and adapt to those situations. I, I mean, I guess I could get philosoph philosophical and say that: How do you know if? How do you differentiate knowledge versus test taking? in in those regards but i guess we'll we'll save that for another day <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I mean i yeah there's there's a lot to that because i think there's challenges within are we really assessing what we're trying to figure out the kids know and can right. is different ways of doing it but the reality of it is a lot of this backwards maps from okay if we want the sat ACT testing, then what, how do we want to assess them in high school? Okay. How do we do that in middle school? Okay. And it literally goes all the way down to elementary right. school in that right. that's how we're testing these kiddos right. starting in the third grade. Right. So the reality of it is we Got want it. them to have the executive functioning skills to find success. Got it. From the beginning. And from the beginning. Got it. Awesome. Okay. Ah, uh, Kevin, this one's for you. This is a good one. Uh, so with all the controversy of SAT, ACT, test optional, uh, so this is for parents who with kids in high school or, uh, yeah. So what path should my high schooler take while applying to college? SAT, ACT, test optional, does their diagnosis impact what test they should take? Um, and additionally, does the region matter or does the type of school matter? Yeah, that well, that's a good one. It's a broad question. Uh, so, you know, first of all, I'll take the test optional SAT, ACT question first. So uh, if your student is applying to a school and uh, taking the test uh, makes them a better applicant for that school. And, and generally, like a rule of thumb is, are they scoring at or above the 50th percentile of that school's average score? Then it may make sense to submit a score. If, you know, if they're not, or if they just have profound test anxiety and can't, can't do it, then don't do it. it. It shouldn't be a massively stressful thing. Um, and, and, I think there are 2,000 or more test optional colleges now. And you know, so the opportunity has is, is probably never been broader for, for folks to submit applications with a test optional. Um, does the diagnosis impact the decision? So this is a, this is taking SAT or ACT, which one should they take? And so I think I'm going to make some people upset on the call, but, but basically I, I'm very reductionist here. You know, the SAT, now the new digital SAT um, offers, you know, the, 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 the number of questions have been reduced. The time per question has been increased. You know, they've made it much more student friendly. So you have over a minute for, for each question. Uh, you have the ability to use a calculator on the entire math section. There's no guessing penalty, so you can just bubble in things to finish the section if you need to without, you know, when you're running out of time. Um, and so that sort of lends itself to, well, if your student's not great at time test because they're running out of time, um, it, it seems like the digital SAT might be the way to go. Uh, and if you get accommodations, you can still take the test in a paper and pencil format, and I do Personally, I prefer taking tests in paper and pencil format, but you know, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not in this generation right now. As far as um, the ACT, the um, the the time per question is usually uh, under a minute per question, and then the um, the English section, which is grammar and usage and sentence structure, it's about thirty six seconds per question. And so, if you have that that sort of performance anxiety issue, 
it's just going to be heightened on a, a test like the ACT. So um, that's it. That, that's what I have to say about about that. Got it. All right. Uh, so the next one, uh, okay, this was, this was again, also unclear. The question was basically what kind of accommodations can my child get and how do I go about getting them? I think we added the two-parter of, okay, maybe SAT, ACT and school testing. So Kevin, I'll let you take the first part and Sheila, I'll let you take the first part. So Kevin, why don't you go ahead? What com what kind of accommodations can my child get? For uh, yes, uh, what kind of accommodations can my child get, and how do I go about getting them from an SAT ACT perspective? Gotcha. Okay, so um, so both SAT and ACT have uh, strong accommodation programs, but they do require a number of hoops to jump through in order to to be approved, and it it's not quick. So, you know, you need to give yourself some lead time, maybe maybe two months ballpark, uh, at least two months. Uh, and you usually need to work with uh, a school officer. So if there's like an office of disability services or some, something in the guidance office, you're working through that person and you can get, you know, myriad accommodations. You can have readers read to you. You can have extra, like the most common thing is, Students get time and a half. Students with ADD or ADHD ask for extra time. Um, so you can get extended time all the way up to double time that, that I know of. You can get, um, you know, the materials in Braille. You can get a reader to read to you. So it really boils down to the diagnosis or the psychoeducational evaluation. And it's always or or generally aligned with the same sorts of accommodations that the high school is giving the students so more often than not is this something that would cost the family more money or is this just something that they are uh uh you know entitled to based on the diagnosis yeah well so psychoeducational evaluation sometimes you have to pay for that um, if you're just getting a doctor's diagnosis and, and either or both of the either of those one of those is required for you to to submit your request for accommodations you either have to have a medical practitioner's diagnosis or uh, a psycho evaluation that says you know you have this sort of issue um, so i guess in that regard it could be out of pocket money uh, but as far as like accommodations, no, everyone like under ADA, everyone has the opportunity to uh, fair and equal education. So there's there's just time, you know, it, it takes time. You need to organize your documents. You need to communicate with the school. You may need to communicate with each of the teachers. You know, you need to advocate for yourself uh, strongly. So, Got yeah. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Sheila, what about accommodations and getting them in, in, in school settings? Yeah, so in school settings, very similarly, um, it's typically not going to happen unless you have a diagnosis. So oftentimes they'll do some accommodating um, in lower in, in elementary school uh, just because it's just a different setting. Once kids get into middle and high school, it really is about having a diagnosis, the diagnosis coming with recommendations for accommodations, and then the accommodations being written into a plan. So this um, can look a little differently from public to private school, however, because some private schools aren't bound to IEPs and, um, and recommendations or accommodations. And so it's something that you need to check in with the school to find out, you know, before you're putting them in, if the if if the expectation is my child will go into this private school with accommodations, it may or may not happen. So it's just something you'll want to know and want to have a conversation with ahead of time. And the other thing is, is how well are teachers trained on filling fulfilling these accommodations? Because if they're not used to it or if they've never seen these accommodations, it's going to be a struggle to get the accommodation once they're in the class. So just having those conversations around, and again, it's all about 
ensuring the confidence and the kids have what they need in order to gain success as they're going through school to access these things um, during testing and after. And this is a silly question, but just to clarify, the accommodations for SAT and ACT, it doesn't matter if you go to a public or a private school, as long as you have the diagnosis and, and you're turning in the paperwork, it, it just depends on sort of where, what in, what center or location you're going to, to take your test. Correct, yep. Um, and, but usually they, they like it best if you work through a school official. So even if it's a private school, someone from their, Got their it. guidance office. Yeah, that helps. That helps organize all the, the material and get it through in a more streamlined way. All right. And the other thing about that is that you don't, if you've never been using the accommodation, you don't even know if it's going to benefit you. If so, if you've been in a school that hasn't been accommodating by giving extra time, then all of a sudden you have the SAT, ACT with the accommodation of extra time. It may work. It may not work. If you haven't practiced it in that school, just because you get it doesn't mean it's beneficial. So accommodations are only beneficial if you've tried them, they benefit you, you know they work, and then you use it. You don't want to just use it on that test in, a, in assumptions that a reader is going to magically make you do better. Got it. So fight the fight only if it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, you want to play with the tools before you <laughs> you have to use sure. them. Sure. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Um next question. This is an interesting one. Um why does my kids performance vary based on the question type? So this kind of blew my mind because I do <laughs> I do do better on multiple choice questions, but my kid does better my kid does worse on multiple choice questions and does better on open-ended questions. And so this was a very relatable question for me. Uh, and I wanted to get, uh, and definitely want to get both your take on this. So Sheila, why don't you start? And then Kevin would love to hear your take on it as well, if you have anything to add. Yeah, this this one's fun. This is a fun answer. Um, so different types of answer, uh, different types of questions are, you know, think about multiple choice, true, false, short answer essays, long answer essays, different kinds of test questions. Um, and one of the things I remember constantly reading about with my own kids is how multiple choice questions for dyslexic students don't, don't work. And I never really understood why. I always thought I was really good at them as a dyslexic, but I do always remember when I got an answer wrong, I was still convinced it was the right answer. So in doing some research and reading and understanding why multiple choice questions don't work well for dyslexic students. So dyslexic students see things differently. So we see things in um, maybe symbols, in visuals, in pictures, we also don't see things the same twice necessarily. So if you think about the obvious, the Bs and the Ds being mixed up backwards, um, symbols, uh, icons being mixed up, not necessarily linear order the same each and every time. We think of things in shades of, of shades of rightness or different shades of, um, there's nothing that's black and white kind of in our mind. And so if you think about a four answer multiple choice question to a dyslexic, often each one of those could be right in a different way or wrong in a different way. Also, if you think about uh, not only is there letter reversal, but there's word reversal. So if you're reading the question, you may read it incorrectly. And so you're choosing the answer that's correct to the way you read the question, but the way you read the question isn't the way the question was intended to be read. And so I remember distinctly having this challenge in school when I would get one wrong. And oftentimes I'd go up to the teacher and say, hey, this is how I read this question. This is the answer. And they would give me credit, which is actually um, not happen, doesn't happen often, but because you could describe and explain, um, there is another right way to do things. 
But on a standardized test, such as ACT, SAT, you're not going up and explaining why your degree of rightness should be counted as correct. So, uh, so that will be a challenge. Um, absolutely. Yeah, it's a lot simpler for my kid. He has impulse control issues. He just wants to be done. <laughs> so. right. And that's the challenge for yeah. kiddos with impulse control. You're just going to rush through it as quickly as you can. And so like, if you think about multiple choice on a computer, it's like uh, four or, or B and the next one C and the next one D and the next one A and then I'm like, okay, I'm done. Um, that's going to be a challenge. So it could be speed and time. It could be, um, you know, true false. It's 50, 50. I don't know. It's this one. So they're not putting a lot of time and effort. Um, uh, essay, short answer essays or essay questions could be very difficult for kids with organization, um, even impulse control, time management. Am I taking too long? Am I taking too short? Do I have to be faster or slower? So those take um, essay and small answer questions could be, there's so many executive functioning skills that go into that. It's very, you have to really get to the root of what is your executive dysfunction to do the essay and short answer questions um, correctly. So that, which takes time. Makes sense. So this is a, this is a broad question because it, you're, your neurodivergence could vary, you know, the, the type of neurodivergent thinking could vary. And also the question type is, is another variable. So I'll generalize. So with standardized tests like SAT and ACT, the, the questions are configured so that usually like the answer choices include like the opposite of the right answer, the right answer, an answer that looks right with some word from the the question stem, and then something that's just, you know, not at all related, and you can you can immediately cross it out. And neurodivergent learners, um, they fall for what's called the answer trap, and that's you know, the question that looks like it could be right because there's some reference to a word in the question stem, and and I guess similar to what uh, Dr. Murphy said. Um, the the neurodivergent learner, the dyslexic learner in this case, they can't see why that's wrong. Like because they can they they basically come down to the to two choices could be right. And they argue why the one fit they usually argue wrong in their mind that the one that uh requires that extra level of argument that it could be right is usually the one they pick and it's it's not right. Um but that's different than say someone with uh, dysgraphia or difficulty with uh, decoding and encoding language like in those math problems that I talked about earlier when you have to convert the, uh, a, a sentence into a math statement um, that could be for an entirely different reason. I mean, ultimately, you know, if you can articulate the knowledge, it shouldn't matter how you're testing. You should just be able to, to articulate the knowledge in whatever way is meaningful that also covers the content correctly. It's just, it's not the way it is, right? You have yeah. standardized tests and, and they're sort of built for, they're, they're, they're built for linear thinkers, I think. So. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you know, we're taking out of the box thinkers and, and making them go through a process that is for, everyone, if you will, you know, and like kind of filtering them through a process. So then we can kind of release them into the world and, and then kind of get their skills out in a different way. So uh, it's, it's, it's a weird system, but you know, it's, that's the way the world works, I guess. Um, so yeah, no, it totally makes sense. But uh, we got a great question that I really want us to address. Um, <clears throat> there's one question that says, <coughs> excuse me, if I'm not certified to work with, uh, dyslexic students, should I not tutor them for SAT, ACT? Some parents have been offended when I say I can't take their students because I don't know how to help a dyslexic student on verbal reading and English sections. Um, 
it's uh so it's it's a really good question uh in the sense that you know there is a a healthy fear of crap you know i don't want to fail the kid uh you know they're paying me money to do a service and i want to do my best job uh, i i want to do my best and i don't want to fail them so uh Kevin, any Kevin, from your experience, I'd love to hear you know what you've done, and and Sheila, from your experience, I'd just love to hear what your thoughts are on this one. So, uh, well, I first of all, I commend the the person that asked the question. Um, so it's nice that uh, it's nice to know that tutors have a moral compass, uh, or or at least that the folks on the call do. Um, so. It's, it's a legitimate question. It's a good question. I think what you can do as a tutor is work with the counselor at the school, um, help the parents understand the accommodations and tell them very transparently you're not a specialist in, in this case, dyslexia, but you'll do your best. You know, you, you can work with the counselor, with the, the school's teachers, if necessary, to, you know, bring all of those resources to bear on the test prep. But, you know, you don't want them to think that you're somehow going to magically help their student, um, you know, become less dyslexic or something like that. So I'll, I will put that out there. Yeah, I would say that it really varies. I mean, dyslexia, too, can be a spectrum. Uh, so, um, so I, yeah, I mean, that's a hard one. I mean, you know, if you're unsure as to... Um, like sometimes knowing what school they go to and, you know, whether they're in gen ed or, you know, just like understanding where they're at and how much they're able to sort of function, um, uh, you know, in a, in, in a regular classroom is usually an indication of how well they're able to do. But I'd say the more questions you ask, the better. Um, but typically they shouldn't be, um, offended by that. But Sheila, what are your thoughts on that one? I think, um, I think you'll only get so far if you aren't searching out, you know, I, I, I think the perfect example is like, why, why are multiple choice difficult for dyslexic students? If you don't know the answer to that, yeah. then you're not going to be able to support that in, in the ACT, SAT testing because there's multiple choice. So if you have these multiple choice and the challenge is, um, you know, how the, it might not be shades of, of correctness is that particular dyslexic issue, but it could be that they're not reading the question and breaking it down correctly. So what is the root of the problem? Um, and so what every dyslexic is very different. And what what is the what is their area of challenge? And so that would be something really important to if you, if you take the time to figure out the root of the problem, and then you support that, or are you using a curriculum and you just do the same thing with every student, no matter who comes through your door? That's two totally different things. So if you're using the same curriculum, you're not modifying based on what that specific students needs are then I would say it's probably a good idea to pass them on to somebody else yeah and because they aren't going to be they'll only be successful up into a point and then they won't be able to get beyond that point without somebody that um is doing something a little differently it doesn't mean mean that they're necessarily an expert but they're doing something a little different or in addition to I would say it's a tough one, but I will definitely tell you that the parents are going to be angrier <laughs> if they've spent the money and have not gotten the results that they absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely doing but, the right thing. Uh, but yeah, no, I think th that's a really good question. We do have some suggestions. We will publish a blog, but in case you are interested in you know maybe asking some questions and pursuing that path you know please reach out to us uh we'll definitely provide some tools in terms of how to go down that path um okay so um yeah we're coming up on the hour uh so maybe there's 
a couple of more questions. So one of them was what types of tests should my high school and middle schooler be ready for? Um, we can easily uh, publish that on the blog. Um, the last question that I wanna answer is um, what can I do if the school or institution does not provide the accommodations needed for my kid? Now, I think where this is coming from is that um, I think this is coming from a parent where a kid was supposed to get the accommodations, but it was kind of inconvenient. And the teacher was sort of negotiating with the kid, like, do you really need this? Like, are you sure you want this? And the kid didn't want to feel different. And they were like, yeah, yeah, that's OK. And, you know, they, so they weren't really standing up for themselves and it ended up being a disadvantage. And so. Um, how do you prevent that? Like, how do you, you know, let the, this, how do you make sure that the school is doing what they're supposed to be doing and that the kid is not embarrassed with their diagnosis? Because a lot of kids these days are getting diagnosed in middle school and high school, which is a very formative year, and they don't want to be seen as different, if you will. So, uh, Sheila, what do you think about that one? Um. So again, public and private are going to be two totally different answers. So no going into a private school if they do accommodations. Um, you should, in either case, public or private, have annual a minimum of annual meetings to discuss uh, accommodations. This could be in the form of an IEP, a 504 and or um, a student success plan, they sometimes call it um, a student learning plan. They Each school may have a different name for it, but it's a meeting that typically is annually. In the meeting, you would have uh, a discussion about what are some accommodations that support the learner in everyday classroom and or test taking. And so if they're not following that, then you call another meeting to say these accommodations aren't being met. I personally, for my own children, I at even elementary school age brought my kids into those meetings because it's so important to empower your, your child in front of the teacher to say what accommodations work for you. What, you know, because they'll say, oh, you give me extra time on test. It doesn't matter. I don't need it. Then you're then then the the teacher is like, yeah, okay, then I don't need to do things that they don't need to do. But then when their student is saying, I really need this other thing, I had a first grade teacher that wouldn't let my son put a number line on his desk because she said it looked messy. Like that's ludicrous. And he said, I really need that number line. So I'm looking at her, we're looking at each other. He needs a number line. It needs to be on his desk. But that was a powerful moment because he could see that we're all three having the conversation around this number line's important. He was able to articulate it. She has to do it because this is the agreement we're having. And so getting the, the kids, even at a really young age, to articulate what their needs are, to be empowered that my brain just thinks differently. Therefore, I need these things in order to show my brilliance mm -hmm. and move on from there. Um, and that can't be denied. And it, and it worked because, um, my kids were tested at every, every grade of a teacher, not necessarily wanting to give them the accommodations that they were entitled to, but because they knew they were in, what they were entitled to, and they took ownership of it, they were able to, um, kind of fight for what they needed. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Again, apologies, uh, we ran out of time. Uh, great discussions as usual. I uh, just kind of wanted to quickly say that we are launching a uh, test prep for neurodivergent learners. Uh, we're gonna be partnering with uh, Kevin on this one. Uh, we are um, going to have a testing assessment for neurodivergent learners in terms of how your neurodivergent learner is going to be testing in certain situations and how are they going to be reacting to uh, the question types based on their executive functioning profile. And so we do have this as a summer program uh, and it is for upper middle schoolers and high schoolers only. Uh, definitely not for elementary school kids 
um, you know, at this given point, uh, please reach us at contact at learnfully.com and try to have the subject testing um, assessment in there. Uh, it is going to be like a limited rollout initially, and we're going to be launching it a little later. Uh, please look out for a blog. We're going to have Kevin's information on there, and uh, we're going to have our uh, video uploaded on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll see you on our next webinar. And Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. It was great having you on. Thanks Bye. for having me. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.